Good morning. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Thirteen years ago, uh, we began uh, a journey for justice. Uh, in the words of Dr. King, when he went from Selma to Montgomery, uh, he famously said, uh, truth crushed to earth will, lie, will rise again. No lie can live forever. And 13 years ago, while April Alley was talking to her father, Sedley, on the eve of his execution, myself, Vanessa Potkin, who is now director of post Fiction litigation at the Innocence Project, and Kelly Henry, uh, the great, great federal defender here uh, in Nashville, <clears throat> were making an application to Governor Bresiden's Board of Pardon and Parole, asking that evidence from the crime scene in the murder of Suzanne Collins, a horrible, horrible murder, uh, be tested with DNA so that we could find whether or not Mr. Sedley Alley was guilty of this crime or whether someone else was, uh, perhaps a serial killer uh, who could be out there committing more crimes if the wrong man was executed. And the evidence that we wanted them to test was men's red underwear found right next to the body of Suzanne Collins, which would have DNA, according to the prosecution, of the person who committed this crime. And there was also uh, biological evidence that could be semen, that could be saliva from the person who committed this crime. And it's a very simple application because all across the country, we had been making applications like this to get DNA testing, and all the courts had said, if you can test that evidence, if it excludes the defendant, if you put it into the CODIS, that's the FBI DNA database, and it gets a hit to someone else or to another unsolved crime that the defendant couldn't commit, it's very clear that that would be proof of innocence and you should get a test. And the parole board, <clears throat> Uh, which included, I'll never forget, Patsy Bruce, uh, a great Nashville uh, songwriter who wrote the song, Mothers Don't Let Your Sons Grow Up to Be Cowboys, uh, responded positively and voted that this testing should happen. And it was sent uh, to the governor, and the governor decided to defer to the courts um, and uh, sent us back uh, to the courts in Memphis, and then unfortunately, in what can only be described as an incorrect, and obviously incorrect interpretation of the law here in Tennessee, they said, oh, you can't get a DNA test here by trying to prove innocence by demonstrating somebody else committed the crime. Our statute was never intended uh, to do that. And we appealed all the way to the United States Supreme Court. Uh, we got no relief, and unfortunately, Sedley Alley was executed without that DNA testing ever being done. Five years later, the Tennessee Supreme Court ruled in a case called State v. Powers that in the Alley case, they made a mistake. Obviously, if you do a DNA test on probative crime scene evidence that could demonstrate somebody else committed the crime, you should be able to do that test. The Tennessee Supreme Court, in effect, said the par Board of Pardon and Parole was right. That should have happened. And that is now the law in the state of Tennessee. Uh, then, just a few months ago, um, uh, we at the Innocence Project got a, a, a really kind of chilling uh, uh, communication uh, that an individual had been arrested in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, for a terrible murder and a rape, and that uh, some investigators there had been looking into his past and discovered that he had been attending uh, an avionics training school in Millicent, Tennessee, uh, and taking classes during the same period of time as the victim in this case, Suzanne Collins. Um, and there was some suspicion perhaps he was a serial killer. And uh, what this led us to do 
uh, was uh, send uh, an investigator out to see if the evidence in the Sedley Alley case had been preserved. Uh, because truth be told, we sent a letter after his execution uh, to the prosecution and asked them to preserve the evidence. And lo and behold, we have discovered it is still there. Uh, took pictures of it, it is still there, it is still available to be tested. And uh, what we did yesterday, with the help of Stephen Johnson, our, our lead uh, uh, Tennessee lawyer, um, is that we filed an application in the district court uh, to do DNA testing of the evidence under the statute with April Alley, who has been uh, duly appointed the executor of her father's estate, got a ruling from a court here uh, in Nashville, where the estate is being probated, that she can stand in the shoes of her father and has the right to make this application under the Tennessee statute, which said, if you're convicted of a murder, um, you are a person, the state is a person for these purposes, at any time you may make an application to do DNA testing if it could demonstrate that you didn't commit the crime. And we now know the Tennessee Supreme Court has said that is something that should happen. And so now here we are 13 years later. <clears throat> What's really extraordinary when you look back at the Sedley Alley case is we know so much more uh, than we did uh, even in 1986 when we made this application about false confessions, for example. So many cases, 20% of our DNA exoneration cases uh, involve false confessions. Uh, confessions where it turns out uh, that uh, uh, you know, police may have fed facts uh, that they believe to be true that weren't true. And you can see that operating in this case. Uh, there was blood on uh, Sedley Alley's vehicle uh, that investigators may well have thought uh, was him hitting uh, uh, Suzanne Collins, the victim, as she was out jogging in a park. Uh, that uh, uh, they saw that Sedley Alley had a screwdriver that he used to use to start his car. And all of a sudden in the confession, uh, there was a statement that a screwdriver was used to uh, puncture uh, 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 Suzanne Collins in the head, right? So they may have believed these things when they interrogated Sedley Alley for hours um, and what he had told uh, his family and lawyers for years is that he was pressured and threatened. Uh, but eventually they get this confession from him and the confession is, I hit Suzanne Collins while she was jogging with my car. And then I tried to bring her into the car, take her to a hospital, then she left, and then I stabbed her in the head with a screwdriver, right? And these were accidents. Well, the autopsy findings showed that these facts that maybe the police believe to be true are false. The blood on the front of the car was from a bird. It wasn't even human blood, right? And uh, to the extent there was any blood there, it was type A, which was not uh, 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 Suzanne Collins. She was type O. Um, and there was no puncture of a screwdriver into the head of Suzanne Collins. The medical examiner said that right away. So these facts were false. And then when they began investigating the crime, they could see that the tire treads from Sedley Alley's car did not match the tire treads found at the crime scene, nor did the shoe prints. Every fact in that confession was disproven by forensic evidence. So this really, on the face of it, looks like a false confession. Unfortunately, this was, sadly, one of the most brutal murders that people could imagine of a 19-year-old uh, Lance Corporal who was very, very popular and, uh, by all accounts, just a wonderful person. Um, and it really shocked this community uh, and continues to shock it today. Uh, and it, it was troubling. The lawyers that represented Mr. Alley, unfortunately, uh, perhaps intimidated by this you know, confession, which in those days people really didn't know about how many false confessions there really are. They said, oh, the client keeps on telling us that he can't remember ever committing the crime. So the only thing we can do to save his life is to try an insanity defense based on multiple personality disorder 
So that explains why he can't remember that he ever committed the crime. Uh, and of course, that defense failed. He was sentenced to death. Um, and he really didn't get, to be frank with you, good representation that f understood how weak this case was and how a case for actual innocence was so strong until Kelly Henry's office wound up representing him at the end. And at the very end, of course, we began seeking that DNA testing. And unfortunately, we failed. Uh, under a decision, unfortunately, that the Tennessee Supreme Court has told us was wrong. So now it is the time uh, uh, to find out the truth. Uh, that phrase of Dr. King, um, you know, truth crushed to earth will rise again. Uh, you'll probably remember the next thing he said, uh, which is the most famous phrase of all, and that is the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Uh, and that's what we're trying to find here today, the truth and justice. We have filed these papers with the court. Um, we truly hope that the district attorney in Memphis will agree with us uh, and let it go forward. We also sent a letter yesterday uh, to the uh, governor uh, of the state of Tennessee asking him uh, if necessary to exercise his powers uh, to order the testing uh, for purposes of granting a posthumous pardon if the tests turn out to show that uh, Sedley Alley was innocent and perhaps uh, identify the person who really committed the crime before that person commits more. So this is a, uh, a journey to find out the truth uh, and to protect public safety. And also here today, before I have the privilege and honor of introducing you to April Alley, we have two other people that have come out in support of this effort, <clears throat> Ray Crone and Sabina Butler, two people who live right here in Nashville, but also share the experience of having been on death row, death row, for crimes they did not commit. So they fully appreciate and understand uh, the, this horrible situation. Um, and without saying anything more, uh, it is really our honor and privilege to introduce to you our client, uh, the petitioner in this case, April Allen. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. This is it's very overwhelming. I feel like I'm being pulled in a thousand different directions. Watching my father die was so painful that I'm I'm hoping I can get the answer one way or the other that I want. As Barry said, there have been tremendous advancements in DNA technology and also our understanding of wrongful convictions since 1985 when the crime occurred, since 1987 when the trial occurred, and even 2006 when Mr. Alley was executed. Um, you know, in, just in terms of false confessions, there have been 365 people throughout the country proven innocent with DNA testing, and 28% of those wrongful convictions involve people who confess to crimes that they did not commit. Um, in terms of just the ability of DNA to prove innocence, um, the technology has advanced, you know, in 1985, what they could do with the evidence to 2006 when we first asked for testing, but even to today. Um, of the 365 people proven innocent with DNA, in 160 of those cases, DNA also identified the actual perpetrator of the crime. And oftentimes, in order to prove innocence, that's exactly what we have to do, compare DNA to the convicted offender databases and, and try to identify the source of the DNA. And you'll hear in a minute from, from Ray Crone, who um, is one of 20 people who were proven innocent with DNA testing who was originally sentenced to death. And in his case, 
um, what was the key to his exoneration was being able to compare tiny pieces of crime scene evidence, blood and saliva from the crime scene, yielding a profile, and being able to search it in the database and it matching to somebody who was a serial assailant and had committed similar crimes. It is never too late to get to the truth. You know, we see right here the enormous, devastating impact and toll that Mr. Ali's execution has had on his daughter, April, and to carry out that execution without performing a test that could have let us know with certainty whether or not he committed the crime was unconscionable in 2006, but we have an opportunity to get to the truth today, and that's what we're asking for. Um, I'd like to introduce... Could you identify yourself, please? Could you identify yourself, please? My name is Vanessa Potkin. Um, I work with Barry Sheck. I'm the Director of Post-Conviction Litigation at the Innocence Project. Um, at this point, I'd like to introduce Ray Crone. My name is Ray Crone. And that could be my sister right there. My mom came to my family. I'm very thankful to be here. I, I consider it a privilege. I'm also excited to be here to offer my, my, my story of uh, support of this DNA testing. DNA testing, as you heard, that freed me from death row. I actually served three years on death row, a total of 10 years altogether. So that DNA testing not only exonerated me, but identified who did it. And I was fortunate enough when I got out in 2002 to be the 100th person in America who had faced a death sentence. 100 mistakes had been made. I was that 100th one. And that day I walked out, I remember standing in front of a whole lot of press, a whole lot of coverage. And, and how did you survive? What was it like? What did you do? And I, I talked about how I read the Bible front to back three and a half times in those 10 years praying for the day that I might be able to prove my innocence. How I slept with that Bible under my pillow. And one of the reporters in the back raised his hand. He said, well, Mr. Crone, given your faith in God, how do you justify him leaving you in prison for 10 years? Wow. How do, how do you answer a deep soul-searching question like that? Why did God leave me in prison for 10 years? And I thought about it. My answer came out. I said, well, maybe it's not about those 10 years I spent in prison. Maybe it's about what I have to do the next 10 years. I've been sharing my story now, what happened to me. Because if it could happen to me, it could happen to anybody. I was six years Air Force veteran, seven years working at a post office. I had no criminal record. At the age of 35, I was on death row. It is because of DNA I'm here to talk to you. I could be like her father. Maybe my family would request a post-DNA testing. And I can tell you the prosecution objected the whole time in Phoenix, Arizona, that testing. But that did free me. It did identify the killer. And it also gave me the opportunity when I got out to become part of a group called Witness Innocence, the only national organization of death row survivors in America. Other men and women who have been sentenced to death for something they didn't do. People like Kurt Bloodsworth, who is our uh, executive director now of Witness Innocence. The first man ever exonerated from DNA, from death row. DNA saved his life. He would be glad to be here too to share his story, uh, some family issues, health issues uh, preventing him. And also a man right here in Tennessee, a Paul House. Mr. Paul House spent a lot of years on Tennessee's death row, suffering, suffering from illness and illnesses that he got as a result being on that road for something he didn't do. DNA freed him also. So I really do consider it a privilege and an honor to be able to speak out and say, please grant this test. Please see that this DNA is done for the family. But as a Tennessee resident, I'm disgusted. I'm outraged to see the history of this case. How does this happen in this great state? Isn't justice what we all, all, even in all of America, hold ourselves out to be about? It's about justice for the rich, for the poor, for the weak, for the strong, for the guilty, and for the innocent. So I'm here to raise my voice in this instant now to call on, on Shelby County, to call on Governor Lee, say, do the right thing. That DNA is important. It's definitive. It can give answers to long sought, to the questions that have been long sought for years and years. Governor Lee, please help this family find those answers. Please be ensure that that DNA is preserved and that testing is properly done. Thank you. Um, my name is Sabrina Butler Smith. I'm also a death row exonerate. Um, I'm from Mississippi. I currently live in t uh, Memphis, Tennessee. And one of the things that we have done in addition to filing this petition for post-conviction DNA relief with the Shelby County Criminal Court Clerk is we have also sent a letter to Governor Bill Lee, the new governor of Tennessee. Because while we believe that Tennessee's post-conviction DNA Act will allow an estate will allow April Alley 
to file this petition, even though her father has been executed, even though her father is not alive any longer. We believe that the statute allows that in order to enable to get to the truth, which is the whole purpose behind the statute to begin with in Tennessee. In the Davidson County Probate Court, has agreed and said that this is explicitly a power of the estate. It's a power of April Alley to get the court in Shelby County to order this DNA testing. But the governor also has that power. The governor's broad clemency power, the governor's broad power under the Tennessee Constitution is broader than the courts in this instance. The governor can order the DNA testing also in the course of making a determination about whether or not to grant a pardon and an exoneration to Sedley Alley. The technology and the legal ability exist to uncover the truth in this case. There has been a cloud over the truth in this case, both before Sedley Alley's execution and certainly after it. When the technology and the legal ability exists to get to the truth, that's what we need to do, and that's why we have asked the governor to do this. It's the reason why the Board of Probation and Parole in 2006 recommended to Governor Bredesen that this be done. And it is tragic that the governor deferred to the courts and the courts in a clearly incorrect interpretation of Tennessee's post-conviction DNA statute denied the DNA testing and allowed Sedley Alley to be executed. And we are asking Governor Lee to right that wrong, to use that broad constitutional clemency power and to order the DNA testing to be done to get to the truth. It's my pleasure to represent you. Good morning, my name is Kelly Henry and I am an assistant federal public defender here in Nashville. In, uh, I'm a supervisor of the Capital Habeas Unit, which um, represents only men and women on Tennessee's death row. And in 2003, it was my honor and privilege to be Sedley Alley's attorney. I was brought into the case after all of his federal appeals um, had concluded, the first round of federal appeals had concluded to do what we refer to as warrant litigation, the litigation you do when um, an execution date is uh, fast approaching. And so what we did, what our team did at that point was to look at the case anew, brand new, question everything, question everything that we thought we knew about the case. And as a former trial attorney, when I started looking at the evidence, I immediately recognized that this was a case of innocence and that nobody, nobody had realized it. N not through years and years of appeals and litigation, everyone who represented Sedley just presumed he was guilty. They didn't listen to him. They didn't listen to him when he said, I don't remember, I can't imagine that I would have done this. They didn't listen. And so we read those reports, we looked at it, we looked at the identification of the assailant, who is about the size of Stephen Johnson, short hair, kind of a short guy. That's why I'm loud. <laughs> Sedley was as tall, if not taller, as Ray Crump. You don't confuse those two people when you're giving an identity. We looked at the confession, and we looked at the crime scene evidence, and we realized, because as a trial attorney, I know false confessions happen. We know it happens, we've seen it. The confession didn't match. We looked at the medical examiner's report that had been suppressed by the Shelby County Court, uh, District Attorney's Office, a report that hadn't been seen for years, that became the centerpiece of our litigation because it put the time of death at a time when we knew where Sedley Alley was. He was actually uh, having been stopped earlier in the evening for what they considered to be a domestic assault. Um, the police had been watching his house. We knew where he was at the time 
that the medical examiner's report indicated death would have occurred. And we tried everything. We filed every kind of pleading that we could think of. We had an investigator, we hired a private investigator who went out. She discovered that Suzanne Collins had a boyfriend in Memphis and a fiance in California. And the boyfriend in Memphis didn't know about that fiance in California. But she was getting ready to end that relationship in Memphis to go back to the boyfriend. That boyfriend drove the exact same wood paneled station wagon that was described as the vehicle that abducted Suzanne Collins. And he matched the description of the person who abducted Suzanne Collins. And so we took that proof and we went to court, we went to federal court, we went to state court, we went to the US Supreme Court, we tried everything. And then we had the good fortune to bring in Barry and Vanessa and their colleague Colin. And they helped us again. Sadly had been through two execution dates by this point where we'd gotten stays. And we couldn't get the stay this time. We couldn't get the testing. That night, the night of his execution, my colleague and I were actually at the home of Judge Merritt arguing a last minute appeal in his house. He issued a stay of execution that night that the Sixth Circuit quickly overturned. We were preparing to file papers in the US Supreme Court when we got word that Sedley had been executed. They didn't wait, they didn't give us the time to file to the US Supreme Court that last time. Sedley gave me one instruction, which was to protect his children. When we made our efforts for DNA testing, when we had our clemency cases, you all who report in Tennessee know these cases can become very public. And we have to ask people to go and to talk to you all to make our case so that you can see the real faces of the individuals who are impacted. April and David grew up believing that their father committed this horrible crime. They grew up with the trauma of that. They grew up orphaned because the state of Tennessee had their father on death row. And I believe, and I will go to my grave believing that he was innocent. And so we have to reach out to these young people who have been so traumatized and say, by the way, everything that you've believed for all these years, that might not be true. He might not have done it. And April told her son, her father, that last day when she was visiting with him on, on death watch, I told Seth, don't come out to the hearing. You have precious few hours left on earth. Spend it with your daughter. And he told her, if I did it, I deserve it. But I don't think I did it. And she said, Dad, I don't care. I love you anyway. And she watched him be executed on June 28th. His, I visited with him on death watch. I did not witness his execution. Very few people get to, wit, to uh, visit with their clients on death watch. The last words were, protect April and David. And so I'm following through on that promise today by arguing for April, who I love and who is amazing. So that's our presentation to you. And if there are any questions or anybody here, we're more than happy. I mean, given all the questions and theories in this case, what's it going to take to establish innocence? Well, it's very easy. It was easy, frankly, 13 years ago. And the, uh, uh, the civilians <laughs> uh, on the Board of Pardon and Parole uh, recognized it. There is men's red underwear. I focus on that because in our more than quarter of a century of DNA testing, I know that that item of evidence, all these years later, is filled with what we call usual wear DNA. <clears throat> in the heat, you sweat, you'll have skin cells in the underwear. Uh, investigators believe, quite rightly, uh, that this men's underwear uh, by the body of Suzanne Collins, all the rest of her clothing was strewn across the lawn where her body was found. That uh, it would be easy to test. We could get a DNA result from that. We could put it in the DNA database and it could hit somebody. Is it this individual that investigators in uh, uh, St. Louis thought uh, because he went to the same school uh, 
is uh, uh, Suzanne Collins, uh, the avionics training school. It might be him. We have some other information that he had been transferred to another place uh, a month before, but there was a graduation exercise the next day uh, that Suzanne Collins was supposed to attend. Maybe he was coming back for that. Uh, we do know that he's under indictment for St. Louis in St. Louis for a horrible crime, and some investigators believe he's a serial offender. So, or, yes, I was going to say. So, do you need a positive hit then uh, with identify somebody else instead, or could it just if it's just not Sidley? Well, Adams, frankly, it's, it's pretty clear from the evidence in this case. If the men's that red underwear mm -hmm. is not from Sedley Alley, and it's another male, right? That's strong evidence of his innocence. There was. Uh, uh, a stain on a brazier uh, that was uh, found by the crime scene and evidence that the perpetrator was biting uh, uh, that brazier or some evidence of damage to uh, the breast of uh, Suzanne Collins right there. Let's say that the men's red underwear matches the scene, the, the, the uh, uh, stain, it could be saliva or what we call amylase, right? And you get what we call a redundant result the same male DNA profile? I mean, really, how do you have underwear at the crime scene left, as the police said, by the assailant? It's not Sedley Alley. It also comes back to, let's say, uh, 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 saliva on the brazier. That's extraordinary proof. It, it was yeah. the brazier on her body, or was it just at the scene? The, the underwear? The brazier. Oh, the brazier was at the scene. At the scene, okay. Right, and so it was the theory of the prosecution that the assailant had bit her on the brazier, causing damage to the nipple. And we had an expert uh, uh, take a look at all this evidence that's stored in the criminal court, right? And he found a stain on that brazier. But beyond that, uh, they initially found semen, right? Uh, uh, at, on the, uh, some of the items of clothing. Uh, and on this, uh, there was a, a 30 inch tree branch uh, I apologize for these details, but uh, this is a very gruesome case. It was a 30-inch tree branch that uh, uh, medical examiner believed was inserted twice uh, uh, into Suzanne Collins and actually perforated her lungs. Um, and there was evidence that there was semen and other biological material on that and also on the white paper that that was wrapped in. There was also uh, some other items of clothing uh, where there were blood stains, and it's unclear whether those were blood stains from Suzanne Collins or there were blood stains from her assailant. So there is a whole host of biological evidence, and we laid out for the Board of Pardon and Parole exactly what evidence, and we laid it out for the courts. We had a PowerPoint presentation with pictures of each of these items of evidence and an explanation of how DNA tests on all of them if they were redundant and they excluded Sedley Alley and they came from a male, that showed he was innocent. But the most important of all, and the thing that is, uh, uh, to this day I am astonished that any court could rule this way uh, in the post-DNA uh, era because I hadn't found one up until this point that did it. Just think, the men's red underwear or the semen, you get an STR DNA profile, right, of a male, other than Sedley Alley, you put it in the CODIS data bank and you get a hit. It's just like what happened with Ray Crone, right? When that was done, they identified the person who really committed the crime. So how can, in, in, as Vanessa was indicating, in 47% of all DNA exonerations that we've had, right, which I think is over 360 at this point, 47% of those, the real person has been identified. That is because of the power of the database. And we've also uh, actually, if necessary, if we can't get an STR a hit through the uh, DNA database, uh, we would attempt in this case to do what's known as genetic genealogy, which opens up even more uh, people. It's what caught the Golden State Killer. So there's lots of things that can be done, but it is just mind boggling that they did not grant the testing 13 years ago. And then five years later, uh, I've been doing this over a quarter of a century, I've never had this happen, right? Five years later, the Tennessee Supreme Court said, we were wrong. The courts were wrong, right? And in this powers versus the state, they said, of course, this statute was passed 
with the explicit understanding that DNA profiles from a crime scene would put into the data bank to find the person who really did it and exonerate an innocent defendant. In fact, Stephen Cohn was then in the legislature, now he's obviously a congressman here, he talked about the data bank. They mentioned that in State v. Powers. Obviously, that is done. It's for purposes of public safety. Just imagine, I mean, this is a horrible crime. This is the kind of crime uh, that, uh, you know, somebody enraged, uh, certainly somebody engaged in serial killing uh, uh, might have committed, right? Don't you want to find that person if it's not Sedley Alley? Don't you want to find that person today? Is, Doesn't what, public safety demand it? What do you do if you test that and it comes back that it is Sedley Alley and it doesn't exclude you? Hey, listen, that can happen, right? We don't believe it because we've looked at this case and we think the evidence is weak, but uh, we've been down this road a number of times before. Uh, there was an individual named Frank Lee Smith. Uh, we, the Innocence Project represented him for years. Uh, we believed another person had committed the crime. He was dying of cancer on X-Wing prison, right? Uh, just after he died, right, we finally were able to get DNA testing, proved that he was innocent. And I've always to this day said if he had gotten proper treatment for his cancer while he was, uh, you know, as opposed to being in, you know, solitary confinement in X-Wing prison, he might have been alive today. That was announced the day that uh, Al Gore conceded to George Bush, right? So he turned out to be innocent, frankly, Smith, and we found the person who really committed the crime, a guy named Jerry Frank Townsend. Uh, there was a case um, involving Roger Coleman. This was an individual in uh, Virginia. A lot of people uh, believed he was innocent. Books were written about it. Took us many years, uh, along with the Centurion Ministry, we were able to get DNA testing at the behest of uh, Governor Warner, who exercised his uh, pardon power to get the testing done. Turned out Roger Coleman was guilty, right? Uh, but there have been other instances, so many instances, you know, uh, of uh, uh, people on death row, exonerated with DNA testing, the real perpetrator identified, right? So look, we're not afraid to find the truth all we ever asked for was the truth. And all I'm pointing out to you in answer to your questions is we want to know. April wants to know. She deserves to know, right? That's just basic human decency. But I point out for all of you living here, right, public safety also <laughs> requires that you try to find out who really committed the crime. Um, and so the statute is there, the law plainly is in our favor. We certainly hope Governor Lee sees the wisdom in this. Um, and I, I can't help it on behalf of Vanessa, Kelly, and I, uh, that Board of Pardon and Parole got it right because it's common sense and it is the law. And now the Tennessee Supreme Court has said, you, you people were right. Patsy Bruce and your colleagues, you were all right when you said the DNA test should have been done 13 years ago. And so we're here again to say, do it now. The person in custody in Missouri, is that either the boyfriend? No, the boyfriend is, uh, uh, no, well. no, the person in, in custody um, uh, in St. Louis, uh, his name is Thomas Bruce. Um, and we did, uh, he is under indictment. Um, and, uh, you know, we have obviously researched his whereabouts. Uh, he himself uh, in his uh, uh, social media posts and we've been able to demonstrate in records. He was at the avionics training school uh, at the same time as uh, Suzanne Collins, right? Uh, as best we've been able to trace it, he was transferred out, but that doesn't mean that he didn't come back at some point. We just don't have all the records of that. And the answer to the question is very simple. The DNA will tell us who committed this crime, and if it's him, we'll find out. Does he match the description of the assailant? Are you, are you asking the state to test it, or are you looking to get access to test it yourself? Well, we, we would certainly work with the, the state. We obviously have a, a, a very good DNA laboratory that is willing to do these testings. We're certainly willing to pay for it. Uh, the actual testing should be done well, and I'm sure that the state would agree with us that it should be done well and reliably. Uh, uh, and I don't really think that's a, a tough question. You know, we can find a way to do it and to get DNA profiles that could be put into the database. That's not a a hard issue at all. Does Mr. Bruce match the description of the assailant in yes, this case? Yes, Mr. Bruce actually does. 
he is also be the description was an individual between five six and five eight uh, with brown hair and a light complexion. Uh, Mr. Bruce would have matched that description as well. And this is you know this lead was given to us uh, by a closest source to law, close to uh, law enforcement in St. Louis, who they were the ones that said, "Gee, we've looked back at this case. We can see that." Uh, you should have gotten the testing 13 years ago, and we think this guy might be good for it. Uh, take a look. That's when we went and looked for the evidence. Um, and I don't want to be here saying that uh, Thomas Bruce committed this crime because I have information that he was transferred out. Uh, that doesn't mean he wasn't here and came back for this graduation ceremony. He was back here for any of a number of reasons. But we don't need <laughs> to reconstruct that all we need to do is test the DNA. The DNA will tell us who committed this crime. I'm wondering why he seems like a possible person. Were there similarities between the crime he's accused of now? And besides yes, the fact there's a rape yes. and murder, are there some similarities yes. in the way it was actually yes. perpetrated? There was, uh, uh, when we got this tip, individuals were saying uh, that uh, in terms of uh, the profile, uh, they believed uh, that this is the kind of thing that he could have done. And they were looking back at other places that he had lived uh, you know, prior to his arrest, uh, <clears throat> uh, I think this year in in uh, St. Louis, uh, to see if he had committed other crimes. So this tip was given to us by investigators that thought he might uh, be a serial offender, um, and that's why they brought it to our attention because they were the ones that pointed out to us that he had been in that avionics uh, uh, school. Sorry, any just. Uh, I understand that you guys are going to talk about Mr. Alley's case specifically, and the details of each of these cases are their own, but we're also almost two weeks away from another scheduled execution in this state. I mean, do you have anything to say about what the problems are identifying here, uh, what the implications are for just the death penalty in general in this state or, or in the country? Since I'm Mr. Johnson's lawyer, I'm probably the best person um, to answer that question for you. And I think that what we have learned about the death penalty in this state, all of the problems that we have with the death penalty, questions of innocence, questions of ineffective assistance of counsel, questions of you know, lethal injection cases, all of these things that are coming to light, the fact that the state of Ohio used the evidence that we presented in Tennessee and the governor there has put a moratorium on the death penalty because he said that we're not going to torture people on my watch just because of some weird decision from the U.S. Supreme Court. I think all of these things are coming together now at a critical juncture where Tennessee, um, unlike other states in this country where the trend is to not execute people, Tennessee is going in the other direction. I would hope that the governor would look at this case and look at the death penalty more broadly and given the fact that he is a new governor, that he would say, wait, it's time to press pause. It's time to press pause and look at this issue as a whole, look at all of these cases. Um, certainly this is not a press conference about Don Johnson. Um, there are many strong reasons for the governor to exercise his clemency power in Mr. Johnson's case, and we hope that, um, you know, that he will do so, certainly. Um, but I just think that this case highlights a specific problem with the death penalty that we've been talking about for many, many years, and it's something that this governor's going to have to grapple with for four, eight years. Uh, <clears throat> I would just mention, uh, in regard to your other question about uh, the death penalty nationwide, <clears throat> uh, science has shown us that innocent people have been executed in this country. Uh, the Innocence Project uh, has been representing for years uh, Eugenia Willingham and Patricia Cox, who are the uh, uh, executors of the estate of Cameron Todd Willingham. And uh, we have demonstrated uh, getting a ruling from the Texas Forensic Science Commission that Cameron Todd Willingham uh, was an innocent man executed based on science, scientific testimony that the fire commissioner in Texas has for years said was junk. I mean, that just couldn't be true. That they allege that he ran through his house uh, throwing out accelerant uh, near Christmas um, and then lit a match and killed his three children, right? And it turns out there was no accelerant uh, throughout the house, that he couldn't have done that. It was plain 
that he didn't commit that crime, um, and uh, uh, that has been demonstrated again and again. We've even gone back uh, with the fire commissioner in Texas, uh, Innocence Project of Texas, and demonstrated other people were convicted uh, wrongly on that, including another person who had been sent to death row. Uh, uh, on May 17th, I commend all of you to go see a movie called Trial by Fire. And this is a movie about the Cameron Todd Willingham case, uh, uh, directed by Ed Zwick, who's won some Academy Awards. Uh, Laura Dern uh, is in this movie, a guy named Jack O'Connell. I've seen it. Uh, it's very powerful. Uh, you will never forget it. And you will not be able to see that movie without wondering, I think, whether or not the state of Tennessee also killed an innocent man, and why shouldn't we find out about it? Uh, and I do believe uh, that this does affect the way people look at capital punishment, right? I mean, reasonable people can differ, I suppose, about whether or not uh, the death penalty is an appropriate sanction for the most heinous of crimes. But reasonable people should not disagree about whether the system uh, of determining whether we should inflict this ultimate punishment um, is a reliable one. Whether the lawyers uh, that are involved uh, from beginning to the end are doing a good job, whether the science that people are relying upon uh, is going to be accurate and reliable, because we know certainly in uh, Cameron Todd Willingsham case, it wasn't. Um, and I think people are coming to terms with it. Uh, you know, there was a governor in Illinois. Uh, we were certainly involved in cases. Uh, he was in favor of the death penalty, George Ryan. And then, you know, he executed one person, and then just before he was about to execute another, evidence emerged that that individual was innocent. And he went down a long road um, and wound up uh, granting clemencies to 176 people, right? Uh, a number of them on the grounds of innocence, but uh, the rest of them just saying, I can't trust this system uh, and go forward with any more executions. And he was a Republican governor that had long supported the death penalty. So people change. And we see that there are governors now uh, in Oregon, in the state of Washington, and most recently and most dramatically, Gavin Newsom in California, that are just saying, look, this system is broken, uh, and it, it's probably not a game that's worth the candle. So you know, uh, whether your reasons are moral uh, or your reasons are just totally practical, recognizing the imperfections of the justice system that we have that is so uh, flawed in terms of race and class and the quality of justice that people get, uh, can you really trust the death penalty inflicting the ultimate punishment? So I think that's part of the answer to your question. I would urge you to see that movie. Has anyone reached out the family of Suzanne Collins? Uh, we, uh, uh, I know that uh, an effort has been uh, made to reach out to them. Uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, very, I am sure, extremely difficult for them. And, and uh, uh, we feel bad about that, badly about that. Uh, we think this, test, this testing should have been done 13 years ago. It could have been done quickly, we would have known. Um, uh, uh, so nobody uh, relishes the idea that uh, uh, from their point of view, certainly uh, uh, this is uh, uh, opening up a, a wound. Uh, uh, so we feel uh, we understand the pain of that family and wish that this testing had happened 13 years ago. Uh, we know it should have. The Tennessee Supreme Court itself has agreed with us on that score. Uh, but uh, uh, the truth should be known. Um, and uh, April Alley and her brother and uh, Sedley Alley's family also deserves to know the truth, and that's why we're here. Any other comments from our wonderful group? Well, thank you all very, very much for coming. We appreciate your attention to this truly, truly important and historic case.